Okay, hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webinar, E-Rate 2025, Critical Updates and Expert Insights for K-12 Leaders. My name is Kevin Hogan. I'm the Content Director for eSchool News, and I'm happy you're joining us today for what I know will be a very insightful and important conversation. The conversation is brought to you by United Data Technologies. UDT is a technology solutions provider that modernizes, secures, and manages complete IT systems for K-12 school districts, higher ed organizations, commercial enterprises, and state and local governments. From endpoint and edge, connectivity and communications, data center to cloud, and the systems in between, UDT delivers integrated IT managed and lifecycle services, cybersecurity, computing, and connectivity solutions with a singular focus, empowering your customers to make insights-driven IT decisions that drive their most important digital priorities. Founded in 1995, UDT is headquartered in Florida with principal offices and solution teams across the United States. Now, before we dive into the conversation, I'd like to take a minute to go over some of the features of the platform that we're using. The event is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides. If you have a question or comment for us, please feel free to throw it in there. There's a chat function that you can launch. Also use this feature to contact someone from the team if you're having a technical question. And I really encourage uh, all the folks out there to, if you have an idea or you have a question, throw it out to, to Keith and Gina. This is a great moment to have their time and, and their available insight for you uh, immediately. So with these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started uh, with some introductions. First with us today is Keith Kruger. Keith is the CEO of COSIN, the Consortium for School Networking, which is the premier nonprofit professional association that serves as the voice of K-12 ed tech leaders in North America. Cozen's mission is enabling inclusive and nimble technology leadership to drive innovation. He was selected by EdTech Magazine for his 2021 K-12 IT influencers. In 2016, Tech and Learning selected him as one of the big 10 most influential people in EdTech, and the Center for Digital Education identified him as a top 30 technologist, transformer, and trailblazer. And Keith, I believe it was you back in 2004 who first schooled me on what E-Rate is <laughs> and what to do with it. So uh, it's always great to speak with you. Also today, uh, Gina Spade. Gina is the founder of Broadband Legal Strategies. Gina is a telecommunication attorney who has spent 13 years at the Federal Communications Commission, where she managed universal service programs, including E-Rate and rural health care. For more than six years, she managed the policy side of the E-Rate team in the Wireline Competition Bureau as an assistant and then deputy division chief in the Telecommunications Access Policy Division. Most recently, Gina was the deputy chief financial officer for a USF program oversight in the office of the managing director at the FCC. In that role, she oversaw the Universal Service Audit Program and the Payment Quality Assurance Program for all universal service programs, including E-Rate and rural healthcare. She now leads her boutique law firm, Broadband Legal Strategies, serving schools, libraries, and companies by leveraging her extensive experience in telecommunications law, policy, and regulatory compliance. So Jeannie and Keith, thanks both for, for taking this time. Um, I think the toughest part of our conversation today is going to keep it keeping it under an hour. There's so many things happening and so many things going on and really appreciate you kind of breaking this down for our for our readers and listeners. Um, maybe we'll get started. Keith, can you give us uh, kind of a, a big picture state of play of what's happening right now uh, in, in the E-rate? Sure. Uh, and uh, thanks, Kevin. And it's great to be with you today. And thanks to our sponsors. Um, as, as I think most of the people on this call know that uh, for over 25 years, 
uh, the most important funding source for technology and education has been the E-Rate program that's administered by the Federal Communications Commission, and uh, over $4 billion a year goes to connect schools and libraries. Uh, the FCC chairwoman, uh, Jessica Rosenwurzel, has had an initiative called Learning Without Limits, and it has really three parts to it. And, and um, it's really uh, kind of building on the traditional E-rate program. Uh, Wi-Fi on hotspots, of course, became very critical during the pandemic. And uh, a lot of that uh, one-time uh, fund emergency connectivity funding has uh, ended. And so uh, the, the, there is uh, this effort to allow E-Rate to uh, provide hotspots. And Gina is going to tell us a little bit more about all those specifics. Another piece, a second piece of this uh, learning without limits is Wi-Fi on buses. And this is new and has started since July 1 that uh, buses, uh, school buses are able to uh, essentially become moving classrooms, allowing students to do their homework uh, as they uh, commute to and from the school. So that's uh, an important new option. What we want to uh, kind of emphasize today is a new pilot program. Technically, it's not part of the E-rate program. It's called a pilot program, but it, it's going to look very familiar to those who have been involved in the E-rate. It's a separate set of, of, uh, uh, of funding specifically designed around cybersecurity. And, and I have to say we're this, we, we should celebrate all of these three enhancements, but particularly the cybersecurity pilot program. Uh, this is an effort that um, is, is a new pilot. And uh, to be very honest, uh, for over uh, four years, uh, in fact, starting uh, right about this time four years ago, uh, COSIN uh, put in a filing with other key uh, players kind of showing the, the FCC why it was so important to support uh, cybersecurity, uh, to have simply broadband and Wi-Fi connectivity and not ensure that it's safe and secure. Uh, seems to me a three-legged stool that falls over. And uh, Homeland Security has identified that uh, cyber cyber attacks on schools especially through ransomware attacks it's the number one targeted sector uh, let me <laughs> let me repeat that the number one targeted sector more than any other sector uh, k-12 has been targeted and so this is the number one concern for my core audiences of heads of technology. So uh, it's taken quite a while to convince the FCC and get through the rule process. But uh, this June, they did establish this three-year pilot program. Now, let me immediately say that while the money can be spent over three years, uh, it's a the money will be done in this one-time funding cycle. And the deadline is next week, November 1st. So if you forget everything else that Gina and I and Kevin tell you today, the most important thing to do is between now and next next week, next November, uh, November 1st, you need to apply in order to be eligible. And this is called a pilot because its purpose is to demonstrate to the Federal Communications Commission uh, what the need is to uh, pilot some uh, opportunities for uh, a variety of different sizes of districts, urban, rural, and, and especially high poverty and, and uh, native uh, populations. Uh, obviously, $200 million is a lot less than the $4 billion a year that the that can be that the overall E-rate program is. So not everyone will be funded. But I want to um, really emphasize we we are we as COSIN are encouraging every school district to, that uh, that applies for E-rate to please put in an application to demonstrate to the Federal Communications Commission what's needed in the area of cybersecurity. Um, and uh, 
we'll talk a little bit about process if you can go to the next slide um the the we're very fortunate in that the fcc has given a pretty inclusive uh way of 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 cover of saying what this pilot will potentially cover and of course it will demonstrate what how the we hope the ongoing permanent e-rate program can be updated uh, since the e-rate program was started, firewalls were covered. However, the definition of what a basic firewall is hasn't been updated since 1999. Now you can imagine and if it, what that what that creates is you're trying to buy a, a product that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and only part of what a current advanced next generation firewall is covered under the traditional e-rate program. So this is an opportunity to uh, go beyond that. Uh, it also has uh, be even more enhanced uh, opportunities with end endpoint protection and response. Uh, identity protections like multi-factor authentication. We've seen a huge jump about 40, just three years ago, only about 40% of school districts were saying they're doing it. That's jumped to about 70%, but there are still a quarter of school districts that don't do multi-factor. So this is an opportunity for those to do that. And then of course, just monitoring detection and response. It's really hard for school districts that um, most school districts, two thirds of them say they don't even have one full time equivalent dedicated to cybersecurity. That's not totally surprising because of so many small uh, and under resourced school districts. But, you know, finding a way to monitor, detect, and respond uh, is going to be critical. So, um, with that, Kevin, I hope that kind of grounds us a little bit about where we are and why it's so important. Absolutely. Thanks, Keith. And I think at this point, maybe we can uh, ask the audience a question with our, our first poll question to see how they're feeling about this application process. Has your school district applied for? Is your school district planning to apply for that cybersecurity pilot program? If you can answer that question. And while we wait for the answer, Keith, maybe can you give any advice to our, uh, our listeners here about um, maybe what they should prioritize on that application? Are there particular aspects of it that they should really focus on? You know, I think that this is really an opportunity. Uh, I, we have to be realistic that a lot of school districts won't get what they apply for, but it is an opportunity to kind of think holistically and um, say, this is what we're doing right now around cybersecurity, because part of the application is to tell what you're currently doing, but also what you need. And even if you don't get the the money from the e-rate, you know, maybe you can convince your school board or maybe, uh, you know, school districts could go together and go to the state legislature that in January, we'll see uh, a lot of uh, legislatures thinking about it. And I think policymakers are becoming more and more aware of just what's at risk with school districts. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit more about the timeline of that? I think you mentioned June is when it was coming out, but are there any other particulars there that you want to emphasize? mean in terms of the, oh, the the timeline of the program itself in terms of the oh of when the money will flow correct uh, well we know that uh, and Gina with her long and extensive experience at the FCC may be able to put look into her crystal ball better than me uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we know exactly the timeline uh, from my perspective of when these will but I suspect they will do it in a rolling way like they that they've done maybe <laughs> it's okay. it's not as much money as what uh, the traditional e-rate program is what what do you think Gina yeah Keith so that's a really good question um you know it really depends on how many people apply honestly um and hello to everyone I didn't um say hello um you know, there's only so many staff people at the commission that are going to be available to work on this. They have a lot of other responsibilities um, around the E-rate and other universal service programs. My guess is the commission will get some extra people to help out um, on a team that looks at this, but they'll first need to kind of get a big picture sense of what has come in the door. Um, and then, as Keith says, hopefully they'll be able to start rolling some decisions out based on that. Um, but I think it 
it will be very interesting because I think the one of the reasons the commission hasn't acted previous to now, and, and as Keith said, this is a very welcome decision. There's been a lot of uncertainty about what's eligible, what is allowed to be applied for, and the commission has mostly responded by telling people, no, you can't get money for anti-spam. You can't get money for antivirus, right? Like they've said what you can't get. Um, but I think this will be a great opportunity for the commission staff to really learn kind of what is going on, what schools are, I think they understand there is a problem, but to really understand the full scope of the problem, what schools and libraries are doing right now, um, and to really understand the technology, because most of the staff is, are lawyers, like myself, and they don't have an extensive IT background for the most part. And so this will be, a. it really is um, an opportunity for the staff to understand what the state of play is so they can make better policy decisions in the future. Yeah, so um, the results have come in. 38% uh, of our audience uh, has applied or is intending to apply. 10% uh, are not. Uh, and then, <clears throat> pardon me, 52% are uncertain. So hopefully at the end of this hour, uh, that uncertainty will go up Go up to the yes. And I anticipate hey, that. Hey, Kevin, well. can I ask a question of Gina? Sure. Uh, Gina, when you look at the application process, how hard is it? I mean, I'm hearing that it isn't, it's familiar and not as difficult as you might think. Um, so that's a good question. I mean, I think it may depend upon how, um, you know, what the school or library already has in place, right? Like how much they have already documented what they're doing, Right. And so um, it's probably going to vary from applicant to applicant how much time it takes, but it's definitely worth taking a look to see. Some Sometimes things seem very overwhelming when you hear about it and then you sit down to do it and you're like, OK, this is this is something I can handle. Like my taxes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But don't wait until the last day. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, Gina, uh, Keith had mentioned, uh, you know, a, a second big aspect of the state of play right now when it comes to E-rate involving Wi-Fi on buses. Can you kind of dig into that a little deeper? Yeah, so it's actually been a year ago now um, in October that the commission adopted um, an order. It was actually <clears throat> styled as a declaratory ruling finding that Wi-Fi on buses is um, serves an educational purpose and therefore is eligible for E-rate funding. Um, and uh, schools um, could apply for this funding starting in the funding year that we're currently in, which began in July. Applications were due um, earlier in the spring. So we have, there have been about 500 applications for Wi-Fi on buses for this um, current funding year. And the really good news is I haven't heard of any issues um, with those applications. A lot of times when there's something new that's rolled out, um, the administrator of the program, USAC, will have questions, will you know, go back to applicants and get more information. And so I haven't really heard of that um, happening as much and they are being funded. And so, so I think that's a really good sign for, um, for the application process and for applicants going forward. My guess is a lot of people are kind of waiting to see through this first year how things go and will, you know, potentially apply um, starting in funding year 2025. Got it. Got it. And with that, you mentioned a court case. Um, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit more about some of the other litigation that is a, about to happen and how that might impact the E-rate program. Yeah, so there, um, so there are a couple of court cases on the on the um, Wi-Fi on buses um, court case, in particular, um, uh, a couple who tragically lost a child due to um, social media bullying um, is is now opposed to expansion of social media or or access to the internet. Um, and they have sued um, the FCC saying that school bus Wi-Fi is outside of the uh, commission's authority because it's off campus. Traditionally, um, the funding for the E-rate program has been um, mostly, but not exclusively, limited to on-campus um, 
the services for schools and libraries. Um, this is in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals at the federal level, um, in which covers the states of Texas, uh, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Um, and that has been briefed and it's set for oral argument in November. So, um, and then any time after that, usually at least a few months, the court can make a decision on what happens there. But that doesn't affect the current funding at this time. Um, this funding year is is um, proceeding as normal. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. things uh, are just progressing as they are. You don't have to worry about it, but it's important to keep an eye on it to see what might be coming down the pike. Yes, right? yeah. The, the biggest case um, is called consumers research. And this is one you may have heard people talking about. Um, it doesn't directly, it's not about the E-rate program itself. Um, what it is about is the funding mechanism for all the universal service programs, including E-rate. Um, so if I can give a tiny bit of history on, um, on how funding works. Um, so in 1997, um, the commission adopted rules to, um, to fund all the universal service programs per congressional directive. And how that works is the FCC requires telecommunications carriers to pay a certain percentage um, fee uh, based on their telecommunications revenues. Um, the commission allowed but didn't require carriers to pass that cost on to consumers. So you and I will see that universal service fee on our landline phone bills, if you still have a landline, and on your cell phone bills primarily. Um, it is not assessed on internet services, just telecommunications. Um, and so uh, the petitioners in this case, Consumer Research, which is a nonprofit organization, they are alleging that, um, that Congress did, doesn't have the authority to delegate um, the contributions mechanism, the, the way to collect the funding to the FCC. And then they also allege the FCC has impermissibly kind of uh, redelegated some of that authority to USAC, the administrator of the program. So that's kind of the legal issue is around delegation. Um, and so that, uh, the current state on that is two circuits, the 11th and 6th circuits, have found the mechanism is fine, it's constitutional, there's no issues with it. But more recently, the 5th circuit found that the way, um, kind of the, the double delegation um, has been implemented is unconstitutional. So both the government and consumers research, the petitioners, have a I've asked the Supreme Court to look at the case um, since it's there's a circuit split currently. And it's, it's probably as tough uh, to prognosticate the, the the timeline on that as it is the uh, the programs with the FCC, <laughs> huh? Well, it can be, but um, so currently it's you know the the question before the Supreme Court is will you take the case? Um, a lot of legal experts and, and Supreme Court observers believe that the that the Supreme Court will take the case because of the circuit split. Um, if they if they do it in this term, um, then they will have to set briefs, take briefs, um, set oral argument, and then make a decision by about the first of of July next year. So there's a lot of questions in the air, as, as you've mentioned, Kevin, as to how quickly that process will go. It could happen this year, or they could wait and put it off to a later term. Got you. Now, Keith, you know, one interesting aspect of this, I think, you know, for a lot of the listeners on, and I know for the readers for eSchool e -School News, and they, they watch the progress of E-Rate, and, you know, they take their annual updates. But one thing that is maybe not front and center is the fact that districts aren't just the recipient of this stuff, that there's an actual advocacy process that they can participate in to influence these funds. Can you, can you extrapolate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. And uh, let me just also plus one in terms of Gina, this is kind of what the Fifth Circuit did is quite surprising. And uh, I think, um, questionable. So we'll see, though, what the, sometimes the Supreme Court has been throwing out longstanding precedent that's been decades long. And so we hold our breath. 
But uh, I, I will also say, as Gina pointed out, that it isn't just the E-rate that's at risk, but uh, rural hospitals and also rural telephone uh, or telecommunications uh, rate payers would see their rates go through the roof if this were to be the case. So, so we will, uh, if, this, if the Supreme Court made what I would say would be a terrible decision and decided that the universal service this mechanism was not uh, legal, uh, we would definitely need to tell every member of Congress uh, that the importance that the E-rate has had uh, on connecting uh, schools. And um, that, first of all, uh, you know, this is going to be, if, if, if the first uh, thing to do to remember is the next uh, week of November first and applying for the for the cybersecurity, the second homework for today is starting to think about how we tell the story of what E-rate has done in your school or school district or library if we have some librarians on this, and certainly we want to tell the information about how much money it's been because over the last 25 years, the reason we have high uh, bandwidth and Wi-Fi in nearly every school in every part of the country is because of E-rate. We are literally the envy of the world in terms of how we have connected our schools and libraries, and that is because of the E-rate and the, the mechanism that we do it that isn't dependent on annual appropriations, but instead is collected by these user fees. So we will need to tell every member of Congress, first of all, how much money that you got last year and how much money you've gotten since the start of the E-rate, and we'll be able to help with that. But even more important, things move in Washington by stories. <laughs> and so we're going to need stories of students or families that you know, during the pandemic, maybe they were sitting out in the parking lot. We're going to need st also stories of what would this mean to your school district if you lost e -rate? What? How, how would that change the way that we do teaching and learning and why is that important? And so we've uh, been able with the help of uh, UDT and eSchool News, anyone who signed up for this uh, uh, this webinar, uh, we will later, either this year or the first of the new year, uh, when it's the right time, we'll alert you of how you can contact your member of Congress. We have some technology that makes it really easy. But what we want you to think about from now until then is what are the stories that we can tell about the impact E-rate has had and what would happen if you lost it. And talk a little bit about, I mean, that sounds like a lot of responsibility, lots of responsibility for our for our listeners, right, to add that to their plate of of homework. Um, do you encourage them to kind of reach out to to the wider community? I mean, is this something that's more of a group effort? Yes, it is. A, it is going to be a community effort. And we're going to be obviously uh, Cosin works with school districts. We're going to be working not only with the technology leaders, but with the whole range of superintendents and principals and organizations and, and teacher unions. And so we work in coalition. We'll work with the library associations and get the word out to libraries. And we will also be locking arms with the rural hospitals and with rural telecommunications telephone companies because their rates would go through the roof if universal service was lost. So let me, although I said start collecting stories, it's not going to be hard. We will be able to tell you how much E-rate you've already received this last year and how much you've gotten over since E-rate was started. But, and we'll give you a template of things you can say to your member of Congress. It's not that easy, not that hard. But it will be even stronger if you can add a paragraph. That's all I'm asking for is a story. Uh, you know, and Kevin, you're a storyteller. So maybe school news can help us with sure. this storytelling, how tips on telling a story. But, you know, what in on the escalator uh, when you're with your member of Congress, you would tell her she needs to do. 
Well, I can certainly point to conversations that I had uh, back in the spring of 2000, uh, going up to 2002, uh, which are you know the stuff of movies uh, in terms of the response and the importance of uh, the E-rate program to keep schools going, right? I mean, it, it really was. You, you can't exaggerate um, how important that was during that time. Yeah. And I think we're going to have to be able to tell the story of why is that still now? Because mm -hmm. uh, policymakers, uh, school board members, uh, superintendents say, well, kids are back at school. Why is it important? We have some really interesting data. And we looked at eight school districts and looked at real data on the school network and found that more connectivity happens during non-school hours from outside the school, primarily at home. So um, there are, <laughs> there's a whole lot of uh, importance, and, and it just at school, how learning has changed. When yeah. the network goes down, uh, and it's everything, everything runs on the network, security cameras, the HVAC system, uh, uh, you know, collecting the cafeteria money all runs on the network. And so yeah. uh, we can't just walk away from it. We can't do payroll without the network. Right, yeah. right. And Gina, does and, that resonate from you, from your experiences on the agency side? Yes, definitely. And one thing I would add on kind of the advocacy side that folks can do kind of as part of their normal, you know, everyday duties is they're likely talking to, you know, other local officials like city um, commission members or county commission or other folks in their um, immediate area. One of the things that we've seen E-Rate do a lot is um, really schools and library service anchor institutions, right? So you get a network to your community uh, with additional capacity that didn't exist before. And now that's available for other, you know, um, government offices, for consumers, right? For businesses. And so that's another impact that the program has made, especially in rural communities where, um, you know, the services uh, and availability of broadband, the accessibility of broadband has really expanded because of the program. And that's something just to start, you know, kind of talking to people about getting it on their minds um, as we, you know, look to the future of the program. Yeah. Couple questions coming in from from the audience here. Um, number one, are are equipment support contracts supported by the cyber funding? And as kind of a follow up of that, where can I get a list of items that actually qualify for the for the cyber funding? Yeah, go ahead, Keith. Oh, you go right ahead. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Um, so yes, so we we have a list um, of resources that we can share um, at the end of the webinar, and I believe. That Maybe has, slide seven, if, if yeah, Chris wants to pull that up. That um, that has links to both the the FCC's and USAC's information pages, and so that will have all of the hopefully all of the information um, that you would be looking for in a you know in a concise manner. Um, I actually did a summary of that order and the summary is like 13 pages long, right? So it is, Be careful what it you is ask for, right? <laughs> right. It is a very lengthy, um, it is a very lengthy order. And so it is hard sometimes to find what you're looking for. Um, specifically, the commission has said equipment is eligible. And um, and I'm not sure if they've said the maintenance contracts, which is what I believe um, the question is about are included on that equipment. But if you take a look at that list, um, it will uh, hopefully explain. And the other thing you can do is on your application, you can be a little bit um, expansive, right? And Or note if you're not sure if something is eligible, but you want to put it in there because then the, the commission in reviewing all of these applications is not going to fund things that they've said are ineligible, right? They'll, they'll get back to you and say, you know, we're going to fund this part. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see that on a lot of the applications that um, because there is a 200 million cap, because we do expect there to be significant demand, that the commission might want to tailor um, some of the applications in a way that helps it understand um, the services and equipment are out there and not necessarily um, agree to fund an entire application. 
Great. Uh, and another just, question. I just, in? Oh, go ahead, Keith. Sorry. I, oh, oh, I just put in the the chat the eligible services oh, list right. that the FCC Excellent. provided for the cyber pilot. Uh, another question coming in: Is this for new product and projects only, or will this also apply to existing uh, agreements? The the attendee says, for instance, twenty four seven SOC monitoring service or Cisco Duo licensing purchase through their local BOCES. Go ahead, Gina. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Keith. So, um, so applicants, it will it will um mostly be for new services because. Once the commission decides who can participate, then applicants will have to go through a competitive bidding process. Um, so, you know, that's, I, 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 in fact, I think the commission has specifically said you can't use an existing contract. And so you will have to seek bids for something um, for new services. So if you're in the middle of a contract, it might mean those particular services can't be paid for. But if, if it's something where you have a contract that's ending and you can go out for new bids, then you'll be able to include those services. Good stuff, good stuff. And I, I know that the FCC has made clear that they that you, you can't double bill. So if the part of the firewall that's already covered could not be covered under the cyber pilot. Got it. That's right. Got it. Uh, at this point, uh, we have a second question that we wanted to throw up to the audience, Chris. If you could, um, if you could do that. So, is your school district planning to go out to bid for E-rate funding next year? And so you can see the various uh, categories and uh, that if you are, which are they going to be, or if you're unsure. So we'll kind of ask that. And at this point, maybe I'll just throw it to both Gina and Keith to talk a little bit about. Some of the programs that are that are uh, coming up, uh, and, and talk about some of those updates. Yeah, um, thanks, Kevin. So um, there are a couple of things that people might want to be aware of. Um, USAC has started doing in-person trainings um, again this year um, since you know it. it they only had one in-person training last year post-COVID. Now they're doing it in multiple locations. And there is one still next week in um, Arkansas, if anybody wants to, to go to it in person. Um, and USAC also has available um, webinars um, on a very regular basis. And so there is a lot of information. I would say if you have questions about your applications, you should first take a look at USAC's website because they have developed tip sheets and um, all kinds of information on there over time that can be really helpful. Um, even if you've looked at it before, there might be something new. Um, one of the things, um, I did attend the training in Dallas a few weeks ago, and one of the things that USAC mentioned um, that is, I would say, is new this year that applicants should be aware of is um, that you need to put your, your end date for your competitive bidding process in the narrative of your Form 470 competitive bidding document, <clears throat> excuse me, or in, the, in an RFP that you issue at the same time. Um, so what has happened in the past is kind of by default, um, uh, there's been a deadline for competitive bids to be submitted. And um, the rule is applicants have to wait 28 days after posting their bids for their bids before they can make a decision. And so that's always been kind of the default for when bids were due. And this year, though, um, USAC is saying if you don't put a date certain as to when the bids are due, that they're going to say the bids can that applicants have to evaluate bids, <clears throat> excuse me, accept bids up until they start evaluating the bids. And so that's kind of this gray area for companies that want to bid, right? Like, what does that mean? When will that happen? And it's also a gray area for schools and libraries that are evaluating. What does it mean for when they start their evaluation process and they don't have to look at any new bids that come in? So I would suggest for companies, get your bids in in 28 days, if it doesn't say, because then you're safe. For schools, you would you should document and, and libraries you should document when you start the evaluation process even if that's like okay i've received the bids i've printed them out 
then you write down, I am now starting, you know, I'm the IT director, I'm now starting the evaluation process, and you document that with a date. Um, so that if USAC asks, when did your competitive bidding process, you know, evaluation begin, then you can show that. And if some vendor sends you a bid, you know, two weeks later, you don't have to look at that if you've already started your competitive bidding process. So that's that's one thing that's getting, I think, is going to be a little, you know, um, different for people because they have the 28 day allowable contract date has always been the default in the past. Um, Great. Yeah, yeah, so we I'm got just, some of the, oh, go ahead. I don't know if you guys can see the results from, from the poll, but only yeah. uh, 5% um, are looking at category one solutions, 11% for category two. Still a number of unsure, which is, I guess, why they're here with us today. And hopefully <laughs> we're helping them out. But that uh, 53 are for both categories. Um, does that surprise or uh, either of you? No, that's about right. And it is a little early, like the, in the process, um, the, uh, the application window, um, opens usually in January and closes in March. So we have a couple of months for people to get ready and start thinking about what they want to, um, apply for. I will say one thing that's new for next year is, um, Wi-Fi hotspots, um, that can be checked out. Um, you know, to students or library patrons and that, um, you know, that can be used off campus. So that's an order that the commission just released in July. And so people might be thinking about that as part of their application process as well for next year. And perhaps some school districts have, and libraries have already completed their five-year category two budget. So um, it's possible that some can't do, uh, they've already expended uh, all of the, the that category. That's right, Keith. Next year is, is the last year of that budget. But if they've spent their money already, they can't get any more until the following funding year. But if you do have some funds left, you know, this is the time in your budget. Next year is the time to use them. So now as I, I look at the poll results and really just a, a high number of unsures in, in both of our questions, maybe I'll rely on both uh, you, Keith and Gina. What um, is the priority for someone who is still kind of <clears throat> unsure of where they are in the process or, or when to do it? I mean, I know Keith, you said that the first step is to fill out that application by November 1st. That's a that's a pretty uh, immediate action point to take. <laughs> But in, in real more, fast for the uh, for the pilot, but the traditional program, uh, you know, this is not a new program, and so I'd, those districts that do it themselves, and and many others use consultants. So it's time to, you know, start thinking about that for this next year. And Gina, remind me the deadlines for the for, for the regular E rate program. Yeah, so the, they haven't been announced yet for next year. They they slightly vary. But you can, applicants can put out um, requests for bids now that the form 470 is available now. So that part of the process can start now. When applications will be accepted is usually January to March, like usually towards the end of March is, is the um, deadline for the window, but that hasn't, uh, USAC hasn't announced that yet. People love coming to the COSIN conference because they're recovering from <laughs> filing their e ring <laughs> we're the we're the last day or day of uh, of uh, march and the first two dates of april so oh. come and celebrate april's april fool's day with us in That's seattle right. <laughs> well maybe i can um ask more of a, a big picture question you both have been so involved with this program for so many years and watched the evolution of it um talk a little bit about um where you hope the trajectory of the program going. I mean, I mean, independent of administrations, it certainly seems, I and mean, we've been talking I, since Al I Gore. Hope, right? what, 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 I hope that we can, can continue uh, in a bipartisan uh, way to make the case. Uh, you know, there were some early bumpy roads back in right when the program was started of waste, claiming waste, fraud, and abuse. But I think overall, regardless of party, regardless of whether you're urban, rural, or suburban, 
uh, we can admit that everybody needs connectivity and uh, uh, the way we do learning. And so, you know, the, I think it's very troubling this fifth di district court decision that it could upend. Uh, it's it not only a universal service just for a history lesson, you know, goes back into the, the 1930s for connecting rural houses to telephone service. So this is not a, a new concept and E-Rate now has been doing it since the late 90s. So uh, we got a program, it works and it sure works because we're not dependent on the annual appropriations process. Let's not lose it. Right. So that's the big picture from Keith. I will, <laughs> I will say, um, you know, I, I now have worked on this program for more than two decades, which makes me feel really old. But, um, you know, it, I think there have been a lot of great changes um, to the program. The last kind of big set of changes before this most recent set was about a decade ago. And, um, and I think that they have really, those changes um, where, uh, the commission allowed um, more upfront charges to be paid for, allowed dark fiber, allowed more flexibility for applicants to decide what services work best for them, um, really expanded competition um, in the program. So we've seen, a, I think, a lot more vendors participate in the program, which is great, right? Because then the schools get better service, better pricing. And so, um, so I think that's been one thing that's um, a really, you know, great change over the last 10 years that we've seen. Now, of course, we see expansion of the program to recognize that learning is going on all the time. You know, kids um, are, are learning at home. I mean, my, I have two in high school right now, and they are, they are using, they use the internet at home for homework all the time. Um, as far as just a little wish of going forward, I hope the commission continues to improve the process of the program to make it easier for applicants to apply. Um, there's a couple of things they have pending right now where they've sought comment and haven't taken action yet that I think would help streamline the program. Um, kind of make the standards better for the application process. Um, I help people a lot with appeals when when they have an issue with their application. And so, um, you know, I think schools and libraries should get the funding they're entitled to under the program. And we shouldn't let overly, you know, technical requirements get in the way of that when it's, it's not waste, fraud, and abuse like he talked about. It's m just pure mistakes. Um, and so I, I hope the commission continues. They've done a great job. They've already adopted some things um, in the past two years that have made the program streamlined a little bit. Um, and to continue to do that, look and see where rules, are they really necessary? You know, is there a way we can make things work more efficiently, get um, decisions out more quickly on applications, get funding out more quickly? Yeah. And one more tip, uh, uh... Kevin, I, I think it's important that school district leaders uh, educate uh, parents and their school board and their community that uh, the school network uh, the, under the Children's Internet Protection Act, which every SIP or better known as SIPA, uh, we do make sure that it's a safe environment and set by local standards. Uh, there has been some misinformation that, you know, if we put Wi-Fi on buses, kids will be doing TikTok. Well, I don't really know of uh, any school uh, network that's actually allowing TikTok. Um, so the, the that's not to say that, that that's not to say that a student doesn't have their own personal device and that we don't have to educate parents about, <laughs> about that. But I think we we do need to tell the story that when the, the traffic that's on school networks is intended to be safe and and those standards are set by local communities. Right. Absolutely. That's right. And Keith, it also has to be for an educational purpose, exactly. right? And so that is that is the primary mission of the program. And so yes. um, that is something that schools ha and libraries, libraries. They're not watching Netflix yes. and, you know. Right. That's right.
Yeah, they have that on their burner phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, you know, a kid can, if they have a data network, right, obviously they can sit on a school bus and access their own network. But as yep. far as what the school is providing, that's going to be the educational resources and the Wi-Fi network that the school wants them to have. Yeah. Uh, another question coming in for the audience. Thank you. Uh, for the student hotspots, um, these folks need to estimate uh, the number and that number will vary from year to year. So the question is, is it okay to have some hotspots that do not get issued out, but were funded? Do they go into those sort of details when it, when it comes to the application? Um, so yes, so the rules, um, there are a lot of safeguards as the commission called them for the program. Um, the commission is concerned about making sure that all of this, the equipment and services that are paid for under the program are actually used. So schools can't buy extras in a given funding year that they do not issue, right? If they if they do that, I mean, they can buy extra, but they can't get E-rate funding for it. Um, and so they have to make sure that all of those are loaned out, they are in use. Um, there are some specific rules about, you know, there can you can suspend them for a certain amount of time. There can be some periods of non-use, but for the for the most part, the equipment and services need to be used during the existing funding year. Great, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and and as I mentioned at the be at the beginning of uh, our event today, the toughest part would be to uh, to end the conversation. But as we get closer to the top of the hour here, I want to leave uh, leave it kind of to both you, Keith and, and Gina, to kind of give us your uh, your executive summary, um, your your thoughts on what our readers, our, our listeners here on this event um, should should prioritize or, you know, when they kind of get off um, get off the webinar here and start to go back to their real jobs and their day to day. Uh, <laughs> any words of encouragement? I'll, I'll speak to those undecided voters that yeah. <laughs> uh, aren't sure if they're going to uh, are going to apply on November first. Uh, please consider doing it. it. It will really help make the program better. We'll, we'll understand what the real demand is. Don't just opt out because you think you're not going to get the money. Yeah, I, I would echo that, Keith. Um, it, it's really important for the commission to understand what the real need is, and they can't do that if people don't tell them, right? That when I was a... a staffer at the commission, that was one of the things like, you know, I only know so much, right? And I need that information to come in so that I can, you know, that I could make the best recommendations to the commissioners that I could. And so if they don't get that information, then they won't be able to make as, uh, decisions as well. Um, there seem, I to, think be more, there seem to be more undecided voters uh, here than in some other situations. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So. Um, I, I would say my big picture point, and this is like kind of in the weeds a little bit, but just make sure that when you're um, applying for uh, for E-rate funding, whether it's in the pilot or just the regular program, one of the new el newly eligible services or just, you know, telecommunications, that you make sure and keep track of everything you've done. Keep your documentation, make sure that you store it somewhere safe, make sure that more than one person at your organization knows where it is. Um, and because that will really help you, you know, successfully navigate any questions or issues that that do arise. I see that a lot in my work that folks can't find, they may not have done anything wrong, but they can't prove it. And so it's really helpful to make sure they keep track of all of all of the pieces of paper um, and and know where they are. Yeah, it's the bureaucracy uh, bugaboo. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but there, you know, there are audits and there's federal law. The commission has to look and make sure, you know, check how much improper payments there are in the program. Um, that's required every year, and so you know, we can applicants can do their part to help keep 
a, a good reputation for the program by by keeping all of that information. Um, because if you can't provide it, then the assumption is you violated the rules. And that's often not the case at all, right? And so if you've got all that documentation, then any naysayers out there about the program, you know, they, they don't have any any bad stories to tell. Right, right. Well, I see that our time is just about up, so I'm going to uh, wrap up the conversation here. I want to thank uh, both Keith and Gina for their for their insights here. I think it was really valuable. Uh, well, maybe we can somehow do another poll to see how uh, our unsure folks uh, feel when we send out our our, our follow up email. Um, also, like to thank the audience member for uh, audience members for participating. And those those questions certainly help guide the conversation, and hopefully, you got some answers. Uh, for what you were looking for. So as a reminder, you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to this recording along with the slides. Thanks again for participating and have a great day.